Good afternoon. This is the getting started video uh, for Astronomy 2002, Section 0, W60. I'm Dr. Thomas Brickner. I'm the instructor. And uh, let's get going. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about where we're heading, the different topics that we're going to study. Uh, and the first group of topics is uh, solar system astronomy. So we're going to study planets like Jupiter, uh, the moons of Jupiter, which are pictured in this uh, image. Um, there's some ring systems in Jupiter. And of course, Saturn's got big ring systems, asteroids, comets, uh, meteorites that fall to Earth. All that is uh, part of the solar system. Uh, and there's a lot to learn. Uh, we'll also learn about the sun, and the sun is the central star of our solar system. The stars are different, uh, decidedly different, so we're going to be studying those as well. Uh, this is an image of Betelgeuse. Most images of stars are simple points of light, um, in, even in the Hubble Space Telescope. But Betelgeuse is close enough and big enough it's a supergiant star, a red supergiant, we call it. We can actually image the surface. So those bright spots are actually kind of like sunspots on our sun, but they're on Betelgeuse. Now, it's a red giant star about 548 light years away from us. And it's about 17 times the mass of our sun. So it's a little bit bigger. It has a fairly uh, low surface temperature, 38 3,600 Kelvin, and uh, we think it's about 8 million years old. And we think that soon, sometime soon, in the next few million years, uh, it's going to um, detonate in a supernova. And one of the things that the past year uh, or so, we've, we've been seeing the brightness of Betelgeuse oscillate. It gets dim, and then it gets bright, and then it gets dim, and then it gets bright. And that gives us a clue about what's actually happening in the center of Betelgeuse where all the nuclear reactions are happening. So everybody wants to figure out what is this baby going to blow up. And we, we don't really know. Uh, we're, we're still working on it. Um, Betelgeuse is uh, the right shoulder of the constellation Orion. And uh, so it's a star that you can see in the winter. Uh, here's a, a diagram um, from Sky and Telescope magazine of, uh, you know, stargazing um, about 7 p.m. on January evenings. You will see Orion climbing up over the eastern edge of the world. Um, and right following Orion, you'll see Sirius the brightest star in the sky. You'll see Taurus, the Pleiades. You'll see a bunch of different stars, Gemini. Um, and when we have clear night, we've been having some clear nights the last few weeks. Uh, hopefully we'll have a few more clear nights if you go out after supper time. That's what you'll see. You'll see Orion. Now, here's a really, really nice stargazing website if you're into stargazing. Um, and... Uh, in the sky.org. Uh, I use it a ton. Here's what it looks like. I sent it to um, target Betelgeuse. Okay. And that's where you have this little green uh, crosshairs down here in the constellation Orion. And you can see that, you know, the green, um, the bottom is the, is, is the earth and it shows the different letters for the directions east. Southeast, south, southeast, south. All right, so if you face uh, roughly southeast at about 7.30 tomorrow night, January 11th, uh, you'll see it when I write about this position. All right, and then you'll, you'll be able to see, you know, here's Sirius down here. And uh, up here, you know, this, this uh, website... It'll map out the other planets and stuff. There's Mars up there. You'll be able to see it. Uranus is up there too, but it's too dim to see with the naked eye. Um, so you'll see all kinds of stuff. You see Taurus and 
the Pleiades are in there as well. And you can adjust the date uh, on these uh, on this page. So if you want to look at something in March or like on your birthday, March 2nd or whatever your birthday is, yeah, you can look it up. Just set the time and the date. You can even change the uh, location. So if you're not in Orlando, um, you know, if you're, you know, up in uh, Jacksonville or Virginia or uh, the Philippine Islands, you can adjust the location and do some stargazing wherever you are. And that brings us to another topic, um, the UCF Robinson Observatory. We might get some observatory time this semester, which we couldn't last semester. Uh, but hopefully spring semester will be a little bit better for us. And uh, the way that that works is the UCF Astronomy Society, which is basically undergraduate astronomy uh, buffs, um, they operate the observatory and they have public events that students are welcome to go to in a normal semester. We can't do that this semester, but we can have, they, they are planning to try virtual sessions, right? So I guess that means Zoom in some way, which ought to be kind of cool because a lot of, uh, a lot of professional astronomers these days, they operate the, the telescopes by remote control. There's people up on the mountaintop running the telescope, but they're down at the bottom of the mountain where it's nice and warm. And they, you know, they have a nice comfy office and they just view this stuff um, over the Internet, you know, that they're looking at all the data and stuff, the images. So uh, kind of like this, the Hubble Space Telescope. Nobody's up there at the Hubble Space Telescope currently, uh, but it's still working. You know, people down, you know, on the ground, uh, I guess probably at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, uh, they run the thing. And they look at the images and they, you know, they study the spectrum and so forth from the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's all virtual. Nobody's up there at the uh, Hubble Space Telescope either. So that's what we'll be doing, hopefully, this semester. And the nice thing is you can earn bonus points. So you can uh, get a little bit of help with your grade by attending a virtual uh, Nights Under the Stars session. All right. So in a normal semester, you get bonus points. Uh, you know, last um, uh, last autumn, two autumns ago, when you know before the spring semester uh, a year ago, we started with the emergency, and but the fall before that, we had a lot of people going to the observatory and racking up some good bonus points, and it's a wonderful it's a wonderful experience. So hopefully next fall. Uh, you'll you'll be able to go to it as well, uh, even if you're not in this class. It's it's open to everybody. So you'll be able to get uh, bonus points this semester if the weather permits. So that's the thing, you know, virtual or in person visit to the observatory. It depends on if you can see anything. And in Florida, that's pretty rough sometimes. But in spring semester. Early in spring semester, usually we get a, a bunch of good nights, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to nab that. Now, you want to keep an eye on the schedule. It's on their website. You can see this is the uh, leftovers from uh, fall semester. And, in fact, I know the, the, the fall semester uh, session they tried, it, it didn't work very good. But it looks like they did something on December 21st, which is way after the end of the semester. Um, and apparently you can look at the recordings of both of those. So um, now that's the website. And uh, you can look it up, Nights Under the Stars. Uh, they have a Facebook page. You can, you know, look at their schedule there. But I don't think they've done any scheduling yet on Facebook. Uh, they're on Twitter as well, so you can look at that. All right. So we'll try to keep an eye on that and I'll announce that when it looks like we're going to have a session and hopefully a bunch of you can go to the virtual session and uh, do the handout, enter some bonus points. All right, let's keep going. We've got um, one more big major group of topics 
and that's uh, galaxies, black holes, and neutron stars. And I'm an astro. I'm not an astronomer. I'm an astrophysicist, and I've been studying the stars for all my life. Matter of fact, the first constellation I learned was in like third grade. My my big brother taught me. He was in Boy Scouts, and he taught me uh, Cassiopeia and Cepheus. And I've been stargazing ever since. And I'm an astrophysicist, and my specialty is black holes and the Big Bang Theory, the early universe, we call it. Uh, this is a picture of galaxy M87 in the little square towards the middle. And then to the right of that is a bigger square, which is a close-up, uh, and it's an infrared image. Okay, and most A lot of times these black holes are hard to see in visible light, but infrared, we can sometimes get a good image. And then the image below that, the square below that, shows the actual black hole. It's somewhere in here, right inside that black area. Now, you can't see the black hole itself, but that ring, that's all the stuff that's getting sucked into the black hole. It's kind of like a swirly, burly uh, whirlpool of matter getting sucked in from other stars and stuff. Uh, and eventually it's going to smush down into the black hole. And as it goes, it gets really, really hot. And that's why it provides a lot of infrared uh, light, which is what you're looking at in that image. Now, this is the galaxy known as M87. The, the mass of that black hole in the center of galaxy M87 is about 4 billion solar masses. That's billion with the letter B for Bravo. 4 billion times the mass of the sun. Now, that's in the galaxy M87. We got one in the Milky Way, too. It's called Sagittarius A star, SGR A star. And this is an image from about 2003, I believe. A uh, famous image. This is the, the chart or the diagram of the orbit of a star called S2. And it's... Um, it's uh, orbiting SGR A star. That's the circle with the plus sign in the middle of it, kind of at the bottom of that ellipse. It's an elliptical orbit. And we're going to be talking about elliptical orbits, Kepler's three laws of planetary motion all through the semester. And this is a great diagram of that. This is how we figured out that the mass of Sagittarius A star is about 4 million solar masses. That's million with an M. 4 million times the mass of the sun. So it's not quite as big as that other one, is, but it's still pretty ginormous. Um, and we can see it in, in infrared. Uh, it's, it's hard to see it visible, as I mentioned. Um, and this is one that they've been following, you can see, since 1992. And then by 2002, they said, well, we've got this orbit pretty much figured out. It's got to be an ellipse of this shape. And knowing the size and the timing, the amount of time it takes to make one orbit on the ellipse, as well as its size, you're able to estimate, believe it or not, you're able to estimate the mass of the central object the, that it, it is orbiting. And in this case, that's the black hole, Sagittarius A star. So this is a very, very famous image. Um, here's a more recent image. Uh, and they've been bagging all kinds of other orbits uh, SGR A star is, is marked with a plus sign in the middle. S2 is not in this diagram, but you can see they got a bunch of other stuff um, that they're following. And uh, they'll eventually get those orbits um, measured up and an even better estimate of the mass of uh, SGR A star. Okay, so that's going to be about the end of the semester when we get to black holes and stuff. The, la the last week of the semester, the next to last week of the semester is always supernova week where we talk about supernovas, which I know a little bit about. And then the very last week of the semester is black holes week, uh, which I know a ton about. Uh, and, uh, and then the week after that, of course, is finals. And you'll have some uh, bonus point study activity to get ready for the final as well. So even if we don't go to the observatory, You'll have some bonus point activity at the end of the semester. 
you'll see as soon as you look at the syllabus and the mission control page. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of uh, how the semester works. And this is pretty important. Uh, first of all, the syllabus page. The syllabus page will be the home page for the next uh, few days. And on the syllabus page, you see normal, you know, syllabus type information. Uh, like here's, you know, a little blurb about homework zero. That's your first week attendance quiz. Um, and, you know, here's the schedule of uh, midterms. There's midterm exam one. Um, and it shows you how the points uh, for the semester are put together. We're going to have a total of 250 points. Um, and you can read about that in the syllabus page. Uh, there's a, a short section on academic integrity, which is pretty important. We have had some students cheating in, in recent semesters, and we don't want to have any more of that. All right. To that end, uh, we will be using the honor lock uh, proctoring system for exams this semester. So you want to read that part really carefully. All right. And there's even a little page to show you how to ex how to install it on Google Chrome, All right? And it works pretty good. Uh, you'll we we will have a practice quiz so you can try it out without you know before you get to the bit the midterm. Okay, so you want to try out the practice quiz, you know, two three times, three or four times until you really get it down how to work on or lock, and then when you get to the midterm, you won't be all nervous and stuff and it'll work smoothly all right so you can read about that there's a little bit more it's not just this image here there's, there's a little bit more information number five the honor lock section uh here's something i want to emphasize you have to stay on a normal ordinary studying pace in this class otherwise you're going to be toast i mean if you if you just wait till the night before the midterm each of the three midterms and then the final, you're going to be toast. I mean, it just doesn't work. There's too much information, too much thinking. And you're going to find that my exams, it's it's not just going to be memorization. And in fact, memorization will help you a little bit, but not a whole lot, because you're mainly going to be doing thinking about stuff. You're going to be making decisions. And that takes some brain power. And but memorization will help a whole lot. So um, so that means you're going to need time to study and think about stuff. And it's important to, to go over this with you, pacing your work, because in the past we've had students, they just don't, they, they mess up their exam. They, they mess up their schedule. They, they blow more than one. You know, everybody can blow one exam or, or miss one exam because we keep the best two out of three midterms. Uh, but if you blow more than that, I mean, you're you're toast. And we've had students do that, and it's because they just don't organize themselves, right? They can't keep the schedule straight. So you, and it's tough, you know, in, in a normal semester when you see me in the classroom, in the lecture hall, three days, you know, three hours a week, I can nag you three hours a week about midterms and homework and all that stuff, but I can't in web courses, you know, remote class. So it's going to be up to you. And this applies especially to you seniors that want to graduate. The fact that you want to graduate does not mean that you're going to pass. What means, what guarantees that you're going to pass is that you stay on pace and crush this class. All right. I'm not going to, you know, every semester there's seniors that, oh, Dr. B, I have, I have to graduate. But, they, you know, and they do that. Like the last, you know, two days before the final or after the final. That's long past time to deal with it. And that's why I say work at a normal pace, keep up with everything, and you'll graduate. All right, here's the grading scale. All right, this is based on 250 points. Uh, so it's uh, 225 or more for an A, 188 out of 250, that's a B. Um, that's roughly 75%. C is 150 or more. A D is 125 or more. So that's half the points. And in my class, very few people actually flunk. Very few people that take all the midterms 
and do an ordinary amount of studying, very few get a D or an F. The people that get D or F are students that don't come to class if it was a regular semester or don't, you know, they spend like five minutes for the entire semester inside web courses. All right, and I could track all that stuff so I could see. And so the students who get D's and F's, that's what they do. They just, they just blow everything off. They're not organized. They don't keep themselves squared away. Uh, and you don't want to do that, all right? All right, because I don't grade on the curve. I mean, you you earn the points, you get the grade. I don't care if if, if everybody gets a, you know, a 225 or more because they study like crazy. You got an A. I don't grade them. I, I mean, I don't curve them, you know, so. All right, the other thing to keep you organized is the mission control page. Okay, and here's an image of, uh, the famous uh, Dr. Katherine Johnson from NASA, uh, the real Katherine Johnson, the, about whom the uh, movie Hidden Figures was about. This is this is a picture of the real Katherine Johnson. Long may she reign. So we've got another page in addition to the syllabus. It's called the Mission Control page, right? And so this is a slightly different way to organize yourself for the semester. Basically, this one is a, correlates lectures, homework, and readings in the textbook. This seems to be, you know, a good way for students to keep an eye on things and, and know what they're doing, you know, and schedule their work and all that kind of stuff. All right, so here's the top of it, and here's a little further down the page. And you can see that, you know, in the, in the top row here, lecture two, and then homework one, is assigned there and it will be due all the homework are due the night before midnight before the midterm uh and so but you get started as soon as you finish lecture two um there's some readings chapter one chapter 5.1 chapter 5.5 and in this class we do a little bit of skipping around in the in the book sometimes so be prepared for that then lecture three and then lecture four when you finish lecture four you can start um, hacking away at homework two. And you can, to go with lecture four, readings in chapter two and three. All right, let's keep going downwards. Here's lecture five and six, similar. And you can see in lecture six, there's a, a homework about parallax, which you read about in chapter 19, a very small part of chapter 19. And then midterm exam one. So this is on uh, the... Uh, mission control page you'll see lectures and then all the lectures that you need to study and view and listen to uh, prior to exam one midterm exam one and then further down the page which I won't show you'll see you know this lectures and homeworks and readings to get ready for midterm exam two midterm exam three and then the final Okay, and there's extra stuff in there, and you'll see that. Uh, so just take a look at the uh, the uh, the mission control page. In fact, read the syllabus, the mission control page, and everything else um, very carefully. Right, the first week of classes we we go pretty light, but you want to look at uh, lecture one and two this week. Uh, do homework zero, the tennis quiz. Maybe start working on homework one. Do your readings and stuff. Uh, and always read carefully. All right. So that's the getting started uh, stuff for you. And uh, one more thing to say, welcome aboard. It'll be fun to teach you this semester.